Okay, so I, <clears throat> we'll get started. Um, thanks for coming. Um, it's the last day of the event, nice day, and there's other many other talks on, so thanks for making the time to come here. Uh, so what we'll be uh, talking about today is uh, a project we've been working on uh, for about a year uh, in my team um, about bringing uh, virtualization-based security uh, to Linux. So in this time, we don't have, um, we can't go into a lot of details, so some of this will be fairly high level. There were some more detailed um, discussions yesterday in the KVM forum on some technical issues, so you can, um, or the KVM um, microconf, uh, Mikhail presented uh, some more deeper updates on them. There are patches, you can, uh, you can go and look at those slides and, and the recordings, I believe. Um, so what we'll be doing covering today, I'm just giving a brief introduction uh, at a high level um, about the architecture. Uh, and then we'll have Tara, we'll talk about our implementation of this using Hyper-V as the hypervisor. Uh, and then Mikhail will be talking about the KVM uh, implementation that he's working on. Uh, so we're actually working on uh, two projects in parallel here. Uh, so just briefly, what is virtualization-based security? So this is not a new concept. Um, and, you know, the, the name of this is potentially open, you know, in the community if people want to change it. It's a um, VBS is uh, something we've taken from the, uh, the Windows world. Um, but essentially, it's about utilizing virtualization to um, enhance the security of the guest OS, uh, both the kernel and user space. And essentially what we're doing, if you imagine the principle that you have a security boundary between the hypervisor and the operating system. Uh, and what we want to do is sort of leverage that uh, security boundary in a similar way that there's a security boundary between, say, the kernel and user space. So um, essentially what the, the model is, and it's fairly flexible, which we'll get into, is that you have a kind of a security monitor uh, in the hypervisor. And depending on, it's going to depend on whether you have a type one or a type two, exactly how that works. Uh, and this is able to make uh, security decisions and enforce properties of the system that uh, are very difficult to um, to change from the kernel uh, or the or the guest user space. Um, so some of the features of this or the primary feature of this include uh, protecting the integrity of security critical guest structures, and that <clears throat> includes a whole lot of things. So that's doing a, a lot of work. That sentence. So this includes things like um, kernel and uh, user space, memory protection, uh, memory permissions, uh, CPU registers, critical state, um, security related state, uh, certain variables, configuration variables, such as um, the SE Linux enforcing um, thing, which uh, there's a, a flag that attackers often set. And even if that is um, somehow sitting in read only memory, if it's still there, you know, there, are, there are ways to um, potentially uh, you know, modify uh, page permissions if you have the right uh, the right attack chain. Um, so we'll get into more detail on exactly what those are uh, down the track. And one thing you can do here is help to prevent the bypass of uh, guest security mechanisms and policies. As I just mentioned, uh, you can uh, potentially use this to enforce, say, that a security policy that's been loaded uh, is um, is is authentic um, and uh, has been verified before it's actually available uh, in the in the guest kernel. And then that kernel, uh, depending on the policy, um, will not be able to if it if it itself is attacked, will not be able to uh, say uh, overwrite that policy. Uh, another aspect of this uh, architecture is that it uh, provides support uh, for a trusted execution environment uh, for running security applications. And um, so it doesn't actually inherently provide a, a T of any particular type. Uh, the idea is that this is an extensible architecture. And if you want to <coughs> set up a, a trusted environment um, for doing things such as key management, credential management, um, or by enforcing uh, executable, executable code integrity, checking uh, the authentication, checking the signatures uh, on executables uh, that are running, uh, and kernel modules and, and various things. So, um, in our work, we uh, have used a port of um, Opti uh, 
to uh, x86 initially, and then we've moved uh, to a, uh, a Linux kernel-based uh, mechanism for this um, trusted execution environment, which in VBS uh, terms is called a secure kernel. Um, and so people who saw the KVM talk yesterday or KVM microconf uh, yesterday would have seen there was a, an Amazon talk about <clears throat> uh, providing um, virtual secure mode, um, Hyper-V virtual secure mode emulation in KVM to allow Windows guests to run and use um, the cred guard facilities that that provides. So we're coming from a kind of a different angle. We're trying to provide the overall environment for this uh, for Linux and to allow uh, different types of uh, secure kernels and security models to be implemented. Um, so why are we doing this? Um, we really think that there is a gap here that uh, Linux is not currently, or mainline Linux is not at the state of the art, both in terms of uh, attackers and the threat environment. Uh, so Linux is obviously scaled out uh, into every, uh, every sort of corner of the globe and beyond. Uh, and so the value that it's protecting is uh, increasingly high. We have uh, all kinds of government, uh, military users, um, health information, uh, banking, and so on. Uh, and the sophistication of the motivation of attackers uh, continues to grow. Um, so we want to try and raise the bar here, uh, and we're trying to build on existing mechanisms. So you know, there are existing hardening mechanisms such as uh, KSPP and the kernel lockdown and so on. So this uh, does not try and replace those. It will potentially enhance those mechanisms to help enforce them and bring some new uh, mechanisms with it. Uh, in the um, you know in the proprietary and out of tree uh, space, there are several enhanced security and lockdown mechanisms, such as GR security, for example, in Linux, um, which is not virtualization-based security, but it's uh, it's it's significantly advanced, uh, I would say. Uh, and there are some other uh, out of tree mechanisms, such as that, uh, and there's also some proprietary. Virtualization-based security mechanisms. I think Samsung uh, is known for their RKP and so on. So, uh, yeah, we would like to try and bring this into mainline. And we're also we're acknowledging. You know, we'd like to acknowledge that we're building on a lot of existing ideas and concepts. Uh, we're taking patches from um, the community in terms of uh, KVM, such as the control register pinning uh, patches. And there was a, a previous. Uh, presentation at a KVM forum by Google on this topic, uh, and we, we studied that uh, fairly closely. So we would really like to invite collaboration uh, across you know, everybody in the community. Um, very briefly, uh, this is an architecture, so we're not trying to prescribe a specific way of doing things that is independent of the ISA, uh, the hypervisor, uh, the type of VMM you have, um, and also the type of hypervisor this uh, will work you know, with type one, type two, and in things in between um, in, in, with different mechanisms for that. Uh, and the security monitor, uh, this is just something that, this is the part that will live inside the hypervisor and that can be very minimal, um, which is probably preferred. And the T implementation, as I mentioned, uh, we call that a secure kernel in our, our code, um, but it could be, uh, it could be opt T, it could be any number of other mechanisms. Um, uh, so yeah, we think that mainline acceptance is critical uh, across the ecosystem, so it's not just the kernel. That's why we're here as uh, uh, various virtualization uh, projects, uh, particularly KBM. Um, and yeah, we have interest in at Microsoft in supporting the existing Hyper-V uh, mechanisms, and Tara will be talking about that. Uh, we're also very interested in the, uh, uh, in the team, in the, in the KBM, uh, side of things, and so we're developing a reference implementation um, that we hope can be adopted uh, as a as a yeah, as a mainline project. Uh, and this, Mikhail will be talking about this. So this includes the changes to KVM that are required. <clears throat> we're working on, and we'd like to collaborate on the, the kernel APIs and, and mechanisms. Um, and then there would be need to be a policy, you know, a flexible policy mechanisms so that people can achieve different types of security goals with this. 
Okay, so I will now hand over to Tara, who is going to cover the Hyper-V aspects. Hello. Uh, so I will go through some of the architecture considerations we had with, for this with Hyper-V and then maybe briefly touch upon implementation when appropriate and then uh, leave you with links of code base that we have basically in the GitHub and what we plan to do with it. Okay, so starting with, so this is a very simplistic view of how a Hyper-V based system looks today. Um, there is hardware, Hyper-V runs in ring minus one and um, the system itself gets divided into partitions. There is a root partition and multiple guest partitions. And each of these partition can have kernel running at ring zero and user space in, at ring three. And now moving on, I want to introduce something called virtual secure mode. I think if, if anyone attended the AWS session yesterday at the KVM forum, they also would have spoken about this. This is primarily a Hyper-V concept uh, where it allows you to divide these partitions in the system into security boundaries. And they, it is called virtual trust level. These boundaries are called virtual trust levels. And ideally, you can have up to 16 trust levels, hyper theoretically, in Hyper-V. Um, for practical purposes and for the purpose of this talk, we just have two, VTL0 and VTL1. And again, there is Hyper-V running at ring minus one. Uh, system is divided into partitions, root and multiple guest partitions, and each of these partitions can now be further divided into um, two secure boundaries, or two VTLs, VTL0 and VTL1. And each of these trust levels can have kernel running at ring zero and user space running at ring one, basically, uh, ring three, sorry. Uh, and one thing I want to mention here is that in the architect Hyper-V's architecture of VTL, uh, higher a VTL, more privileged it is, and that is how it guarantees security boundaries. Uh, in, in this particular case, VTL one is more privileged than VTL zero. And Hyper-V guarantees, Hyper-V restricts access between VTLs, Hyper-V restricts um, tampering between VTLs, tampering of data, tampering of um, address space, tampering of execution between the VTLs. So some of the features that get offered under this bucket of VSM and virtual trust level, one is virtual processor state isolation. Within each of these VTLs, each virtual, so each uh, CPU running in a partition has now two execution states with within a partition, a VTL0 execution state and a VTL1 execution state, and they are separate, basically. Uh, memory is split between the VTLs, and um, memory is split, and then Hyper-V controls the access. Like I said before, Hyper-V controls the access across, v the, across the memory boundary of the VTL. And memory access permissions are hierarchical. Hyper-V guarantees that as well, by which I mean that um, within a partition, within the physical address space, the access restrictions that are set by a higher privileged VTL takes preference over the access permission, memory access permissions that are set by a lower privileged VTL. And this forms a key tenet of what we are trying to implement later on. We'll see that. And finally, what VSM offers is separate handling of interrupts and intercepts between these trusted ex between these execution environments, which means each VTL can handle their own interrupts, which makes it easier to handle secure interrupts and secure intercepts without uh, any interference from the software running in the normal kernel. Um, I just want to go back to this picture and say that in, in our example, what we will see is that VTL zero will run the normal operating system, the guest kernel or the host OS or whatever the normal operating system and VTL1 is where we want to try and run the secure kernel, basically. Moving on. So now with now that Hyper-V has VSM and we want to do Linux virtualization-based security, there are a bunch of features that we can target with this architecture that Hyper-V gives us. First and foremost, what we can do is kernel hardening, by which I mean you can back up the access permissions for all critical kernel structures or kernel uh, resources, memory, critical data structures, critical system registers, things like that. 
The other thing you can do is to offload some of the policies and some of the uh, authentication mechanism into this higher privileged execution environment, thereby making sure that it is tamper proof and it, all, these authentic all, all these critical policies run at a higher trust level, basically. And finally, you can use this separate execution environment or a higher privileged execution environment to store critical sensitive data like passwords, keys, and make sure that there is no unauthorized access that can happen across the boundaries. Uh, with all this, we I don't think we should be, we are, we are not targeting all this one shot and probably we should not be doing some of this ever. But what we are targeting for at least the first phase of the project is basic kernel hardening, backing up some of the kernel hardening features with um, VSM and LVBS. Uh, with that, I want to talk a little bit on the threat model for the kernel hardening, uh, just to be on the same page on what we are talking, what I'm talking about. Um, so what we are trying to protect here is critical kernel resources from a user space attacker who has somehow gained entry into the kernel by exploiting an existing vulnerability. The idea here is that the attacker has already an arbitrary read write access to the guest kernel due to this vulnerability, and we want to protect the system resources from such an attacker. That is the basic premise. Yes, excuse me. Um, I have been wondering, I mean, what's the advantage of doing this instead of just, for instance, creating separate guests with different privilege levels and making sure that each of them have, you know, higher priority or running secure stuff or even using confidential VMs, which is, you know, available today or even, you know, secure, secure zones or something like that. Yeah. So confidential VM has a separate um, security model. The confidential, the premise of confidential computing is to protect the system from hypervisor itself. Hypervisor is out of TCB in confidential computing, whereas here hypervisor is still within TCB. So this is a space where it is kind of, they are complementary features. Right. So what is the advantage of using this feature instead of using different models? I mean, I'm not seeing... No, so this is the evolution. I think while once we have confidential computing, there will be pieces of this that will need to move into okay. the confidential computing system. Okay. So this is probably an evolving model that we are talking about. Okay, so where was I? Yes, the threat model. Uh, yes, so such an attacker, what, what I was trying to say is he, he the attacker already has read-write access to guest kernel. And uh, we want to protect the system resources from such an attack. That is the premise here. I want to call out here that in this whole process of the architecture and implementation, we have, are piggybacking on the fact that we can trust Secure Boot, by which I, what I mean is uh, we assume that the kernel or the operating system is not, is not tampered with or, uh, during boot because there is secure boot and secure boot is already authenticated and validated. And so it is, it is not tampered with at boot till the first user process starts running, which is the init process as far as Linux is concerned. And finally, I want to say that with this, what we are targeting when I say kernel hardening, uh, um, we are not actually offering any extra feature. We are not introducing any extra feature to Linux kernel. All we are offering is defense in depth. Linux kernel already has these hardening mechanisms. Kernel already allows you to protect critical system registers. Kernel already protects pieces of um, memory by marking them as read only or the text section as uh, read execute and non-writable and all that stuff. We are not, so there's no new feature itself being added. What is happening is defense in depth. They say that even if the kernel is tampered with, if you can back these up via hypervisor or a higher trusted environment, a higher trust execution environment, they cannot be tampered. These resources cannot be tampered with. And I want to briefly talk about the hardware requirements we have here. Um, one is support, the architecture should support second level address translation um, feature. And the other one is that uh, we need the CPU feature that actually differentiates between the execute mode, kernel execute mode and user execute mode like MBEC. Uh, Finally, yeah, so when we come to the architecture, I, I've tried to break this down into piece by piece. Um, and then finally, we'll look at the big picture of what the system looks should look like. 
So first and foremost, what we, like James mentioned, we wanted to have an hypervisor agnostic solution. So what we are trying to say is that we want to have all the kernel frameworks there and we want to have the uh, protection mechanism and the monitoring all go into this common layer. And from that common layer, get, it gets distributed to whichever hypervisor driver has hooked into it. And so one such example of this common layer is Hickey, which Mikhail will actually talk about. And we talked about it. Uh, he talked about it yesterday in the KVM microconference. Um, and it's a hypervisor enforced kernel integrity layer. And uh, we want to have such ag agnostic layers through to which hypervisor drivers can hook in. And so that if this is not the architecture is not constrained to either Hyper-V or KVM or any other hypervisor itself. Um, secure kernel, I think James talked a bit about it. So now that there's this big question of what to run as secure kernel now that there is this trusted execution environment. And some of the things, I don't have time to go through everything we considered for this, but some of the thing, key considerations we had was one was that we needed, wanted a small TCB in secure, as secure, in the software that runs in VTL1. We also wanted the support to add the secure interfaces for communication between uh, the normal world and the secure world between VTL0 and VTL1. And finally, we wanted it to be maintainable. We didn't really want to go and write our own piece of software for to be put in VTL1. Opti was actually a very, very strong contender for this. The only reason why Opti, we didn't choose Opti as the for the first phase of this project was because Opti doesn't have x64 support the x or the x64 support for opti is very minimal and that's the primary reason why we couldn't we did not choose this as a opti as a secure kernel uh, so the initial choice is a minimal linux kernel where we are trying to strip down most of the things we don't need in the linux kernel to run it as a secure kernel uh, this is evolving it is not set in stone that we should use linux as a secure kernel and as we progress along the uh, uh, with the project, and if we find su more suitable candidates to run a secure kernel, we will change this. Uh, so a bit. Uh, so now. Second. So I just wanted to ask a question about the idea that the hypervisor would be the one that uh, actually does all of this security, because you're running into the problem that we are investing less trust in the hypervisor. This is exactly the other way. You're investing more trust in it. In a world, say, of confidential computing where the hypervisor can't actually protect the guest, how does this uh, interface fit into it? Because realistically, it would have to be in the kernel itself, in the guest. Yeah, so uh, Tara, did you have a... Right. I was just going to mention that we do have a work stream on this. We have somebody uh, looking into so, this and has done, we haven't presented this publicly yet, but we do have uh, confidential computing um, architecturally. I, I just want to say that, see, confidential, com again, like I mentioned, confidential computing is protecting the system from hypervisor. This is, it will not give you user space to kernel space protection still. So these are complementary technologies. So even when there is confidential computing that comes, like let's say we implement, con we include confidential computing, you will still need pieces of this to sit in the kernel to enforce um, the user space kernel space integrity, basically. So Tara, if I could chime in there. Yeah. The reason we use Hyper-V here, James, is to implement the software notion of VTLs. That's really the only thing Hyper-V provides. Now with new hardware, where hardware is giving us that abstraction of different privilege levels, we don't need to trust Hyper-V to run a secure kernel in a higher privilege level, right? So yeah. these concepts really map very well to the emerging hardware in the conferential computing space, number one. Number two, as Sarah says, right, even if I don't trust the hypervisor, confidential computing stacks are still vulnerable to some user space process you know, uh, attacking the kernel. And this would allow us to really lock down uh, those kinds of attacks. Yes. So you talked about the minimal Linux kernel config. One of the thing on Windows, the secure kernel actually has 
less syscall interfaces. And that's one of the things that expose the kernel to attacks. Uh, so in the minimal Linux kernel config, you are reducing syscalls as well? From... Yes. So right now, the kernel doesn't even have a proper user mode running. OK. So but yes. <laughs> one last question that I have is for like Windows based VBS, one of the first user was something like Credential Guard. Do you have use cases, something like that for uh, Linux so as well? Because right now you're focusing on like yes. uh, kernel security hardening. So like I said, there are multiple things that are possible with VSM and LVBS. One of it is something like Cred Guard, whatever you said, like where you store your keys and you isolate the, your keys and passwords and all that stuff. Yeah, but that's an evolution of this project. We haven't considered it. We haven't. We are not working on it yet. So, so what I wanted to tell you is the choice of Linux, as Tara said, is simply the initial choice. As we look at new environments that are coming up, like Coconut, for instance, that can run in the higher privilege level, we would choose that. I see, yeah. Right? And in fact, somebody is looking at a project where the LSM in Linux can be hosted inside that uh, secure kernel. Yes, so, I think, yeah, that's a good idea. If I get a good port of Opti on x64, I will switch any day. <laughs> a secure kernel. But yeah. Anyways, so talk, moving on. Uh, talking about the control interfaces between VTL0 and VTL1. One, asynchronous. I think you should have heard of this yesterday in the AWS talk. Uh, so by synchronous, I mean the VTL0 can explicitly issue a VTL call. It, uh, it is transferred via the Hyper-V and the VTL call and, and the Hyper-V switches the execution environment for that CPU into VTL1. And similarly, VTL1 issues a VTL return call and Hyper-V switches the execution environment to VTL0, basically. And the other interface is via interrupts, where the premise is that if there is an interrupt pending in a higher priority VTL in VTL1 in this case, uh, the Hyper-V will switch execution of that CPU from VTL0 into VTL1, which becomes kind of asynchronous. You have not, ex VTL0 doesn't explicitly call into VTL1 in this particular case. And uh, on the flip side, if there is a interrupt pending in VTL0 while a CPU is executing in VTL1, uh, Hyper-V does not switch. Hy so VTL1, the CPU has to explicitly exit VTL1 and then enter VTL0 for that interrupt to be delivered and handled. Um, so yes, boot, I want to again come back to that. So for in, in this particular case, while we are with the Hyper-V architecture, we trust secure boot. What it means is, and that is very important for how we have designed the boot here. Uh, so we are saying that till the init process runs, uh, because of secure boot, the kernel is not tampered with. Uh, which is important because when we started architecting and designing this, we didn't really want to go and modify bootloaders to get this design up and running. And we, if we are talking of deploying this across architectures, it is better for us if we don't have to modify bootloaders. So in this model, what we can say is we trust secure boot. We let the kernel boot in VTL0. We let the normal operating system boot in VTL0 in lower privilege environment. And at some point in the boot process, earlier in the boot process, we boot we, we allow vtl0 to boot vtl1 or allow vtl0 to send processes into vtl1 and boot vtl1 that's what we do and somewhere during the late stage of the boot we enforce all these we send the policies and the monitoring policies and the enforcements that we need into vtl1 and at that point we lock down the guest operating system uh, i think i am am i out of time yeah, maybe. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so I will not go through this then because this, yeah, this is probably too much for this. And anyway, so again, the big picture, this is how it looks like. There is a regular normal operating system running in VTL0. There is secure kernel running in VTL1. Regular user space applications running in VTL0. We want trustless to run in VTL1 at some point when this architecture evolves. Right now, the code we have, we don't have anything running in secure user space. 
during boot, like I said, the early boot driver comes up uh, and bo boots the CPUs in VTL1 and returns back. During the later stage of boot, we have all these kernel frameworks that boots and comes up and it call into this common hypervisor agnostic layer, which kind of which calls into your hypervisor driver, and then that issues the calls into VTL1 to enforce all the policies, monitoring all the memory protections that we want, the control register monitoring and all that kind of stuff. And at that point, we assume that this guest is locked down and uh, we can hand over the control to user space. And finally, I want to show this picture where in case of a violation or an access policy violation or an access violation, what happens is that Hyper-V, this is where that asynchronous communication comes into picture. Hyper-V pings or Hyper-V intercepts VTL1 saying that there is an access policy violation. There is a, probably a, a memory access violation or whatever. And then VTL1 gathers information on what happened and injects an exception into VTL0 at which point either guest kernel can choose to die or take appropriate action. With that, I leave you with the code. So we have both the secure kernel code and the guest kernel code with the changes in the Git in these GitHub repos. What we intend to do is to now start breaking down into smaller pieces and send patches for review and feedback and all to the, to the community. And I hand over to Mikhail to discuss the KVM portions of this. Thanks, sir. So I will focus now on the what is specific to KVM. Um, so first here, um, well, the big picture of the architecture. And I would like to highlight, because there's some interest in computational computing. So again, with the picture, it might be easier to understand. So in a nutshell, uh, the trend model based computational computing is to protect the guest from the IP result and the host. And with our trend model, it's to protect the guests from itself. So that's not the same goal, and both can be complementary. So with that in mind, um, so in a nutshell here, uh, well, we have the guest kernel uh, with some changes um, to implement some hyper call to call KVM, uh, but also to um, kind of um, enlighten it's on memory management, for instance, or even the control register changes. So for this to kind of request to the hypervisor to enforce some position or not, or allow some uh, changes. And well, this is this architecture is much more simple than the Hyper-V1 with VTLs. Uh, but as we said, uh, this might evolve with commercial computing features, uh, such as uh, coconut services and uh, things like that. So we sent an RFC uh, a few days ago. You can take a look um, and uh, we'll provide some link at the end of the talk. Um, and until so it brings um, common gas can implementation uh, on which uh, each IPSO can plug in its own um, specificities. Uh, for KVM, there's, new, there's two new IP calls, one uh, for CI control register pinning enforcement, and another for memory permission enforcement. So mainly security policy definition. And there is also um, a new KVM interface, uh, well, between the IP and the host uh, to let, well, know the host about the guest security policy. So it might be required, in fact, because well, for different reasons, but one of them might be, for instance, uh, to report attack attempts or even to uh, act, like, I don't know, to shut down the VM or to freeze it or to do a snapshot, I don't know. Uh, you can do a lot of stuff. And other thing is uh, to let the host know about the restriction of the guest and be able to kind of contribute to these restrictions. For instance, uh, the host might expose some drivers, so some memory mappings, and well, we might we might want these memory mappings to be also uh, constrained by the guest wishes. So, um, two app goals. First one looks like this. Uh, so the idea is to be able to pin some flags of control registers. 
So this includes, um, well, critical control registers, so mainly CR0 and CR4. Uh, for instance, uh, the ability to uh, disable uh, the write protection mechanism, which is, of course, really important uh, in case when you want to add a new gas cannon. And, uh, well, these are the a lot of other flags as well, like for us maps, map, and well, a lot of different security features. Um, when there's a policy violation, uh, KVM in this case can create a general protection fault that might be handled or not by the gas scanner. So, um, but the information there. And it can also uh, create a PM exit before that for the host to know and react if it wants. Um, so, highlight on some specificities of, on this second hypercall. So, uh, we're using, well, mostly leveraging EPT, so the extended page table uh, attributes. Um, and the hypercall is, well, looks simple, but it's not, in fact. Um, the idea is to pass a list Question, of Michael? page ranges. So, yes. if, if you look back at what Tara presented, um, the, the interactions were between the guest kernel and the secure kernel that's running in a higher privilege level. And then from that secure kernel, we interacted with the hypervisor. That, that's the flow, right? So that is the flow for the current impl IPV implementation. On Hyper-V implementation. Yes. So as I look at the KVM implementation, we are completely bypassing a secure kernel. There is no secure kernel. Right. And yesterday we learned about the plans the KVM folks have, at least in Amazon, yeah. in terms of building uh, these VTL abstractions yeah. in KVM. So perhaps we should look at how we integrate this. You know, as yeah. opposed to having hyper calls for doing this directly, we should be looking at interacting with the secure kernel in a way that is not hyper call related. It's like a higher level interaction because down the road we will have other services like Red Guard yeah. or you know, LSM and things like that, that can't be all encapsulated in a hypercall. So maybe that's the, the right abstraction at which we do that. And from the secure kernel, we could do the hypercalls. Yeah, so that's right. It's definitely something we are interested in. Um, there's something to keep in mind. Um, so first, we need an interface. So uh, this interface might be VM calls, this might be hypercall. Anyway, we need to standard interface uh, that can bring some security guarantees. And then, uh, well, first of all, the VTL patches are not in mainline, such as our own. So we may want to start with something simple, with the first interface. And for instance, for the CI pinning patches, uh, well, it's not complex at all. So this can fully be implemented by KVM itself. And later on, if we have um, another way to enforce that with VTL, coconut, or whatever, well, we could leverage that. So that's not blocker, uh, but we could still as an incremental evolution of our implementation. What matters is really the security guarantees we want to provide and the interface, the guest um, interface with the hypervisor, so, and all the abstraction on that. Okay, so I wanted to comment on, on, on your question, actually. So you said, well, this is not going through the secure kernel. It's a straight hypercall to KVM. Uh, can't we make it go through the secure kernel? But I would say the opposite. Isn't it a good thing that this is just KVM and it doesn't actually involve the secure kernel? Because there might be other use cases where you want to use the CR pinning, for example, without secure kernel, without a, a LVBS. This actually seems like a generally useful thing for many KVM users, not just for this, right, the, so keep it, it's good. My response would be that maybe there's a class of activities that should be directly uh, supported by the hypervisor, right? And we could do that on the Hyper-V side too. We don't need to go to the secure kernel and come back to the hypervisor. These calls could be made directly from the guest onto the hypervisor, irrespective of whether the hypervisor is Hyper-V or KVM. Okay. But then there are higher level constructs like, you know, hosting the entire LSM in the secure kernel and the interactions with the LSM going through that east-west interface, or maybe cred guard or, you know, driver guard and things like that. So we need both kinds of interfaces, uh, for both KVM and Hyper-V. And one thing to keep in mind is that Hyper-V is 
already ready for this kind of security features and it has been for a long time. KVM is not and we might not want to wait for years to well for KVM to kind of uh, get the IPv features uh, and in fact might not be needed so yes both of you are right. So um, let's go to another feature we implement in KVM which is already in place uh, in IPv but um, now we are implementing that for um, KVM2. So it's really important because it's enabled to enforce memory restrictions, especially on uh, executable, executable pages, um, in a way which is efficient. Um, so I'll go really quickly about that. The idea, well, it's an Intel, well, this is also the same for um, AMD, uh, but in this case, uh, it's called mode-based execution control. It's a way uh, for the EPT, so the, um, um, hypervisor manage memory table permissions uh, to kind of split uh, the executable bits into two, executable for use space or executable for kernel space. And that enables you enforce security policy um, only on one of the side. And you know, what's in, interesting in your use case is to enforce on only the kernel side because your space might be much more complex and might be also handled by the kernel itself. So in a nutshell, uh, without MBAC, we need to make a lot of uh, the <coughs> guest um, memory executable because we don't know and it might be used by user space because, well, here we are talking about uh, physical pages, not virtual pages permissions. And with MBAC, uh, we can make the guest uh, kernel memory protection much more well secure. So to control really what we want uh, on the physical memory pages to be executable or not. So you can find the code uh, of the first RFC and the second one uh, in this uh, GitHub organization, GitHub repo. And uh, yeah, it's along with uh, the other uh, set of um, comments. So um, to wrap up, um, what we like to do is, and what we're working on, is to improve the security of Linux. And that might be uh, by using uh, either KV, uh, KVM or IPv, uh, or even other IPvs, like Zen or whatever you want. So we're definitely open to new contribution on this part, and for now we are focusing on KVM and IPv. Uh, yeah, it's a different death mechanism. Um, so security is not perfect, um, and we're trying to improve that uh, thanks to virtualization. So we open to any feedback. So please talk to us as any mails, um, yeah, on the mailing list or here. I don't think so. We have two minutes. So there's a demo on the slide which should run. Yes, and it's on the GitHub too. A quick question. This is um, a bit hard. To Quick question on the, the page permission enforcement um, that, that you just had up. Um, the implication of being able to control those bits, some of, some of what you talked about imply that you're trying to also protect the, the kernel from itself after it's booted, right? Yes. Uh, so the implication of what I'm hearing is that at VTL1 or maybe in the, the hypervisor, uh, you are going to protect against changing the permissions of already set yes. permissions, right? Doesn't that imply you have what amounts to shadow nested page tables then? Um, so, well, the thing is, um, well, this is different use cases. So here we are mainly targeting um, hardware-based virtualization. So using right. uh, VTX and, and back and so on. Um, this, so for instance, uh, all these changes also work uh, with nested virtualization, except the executable bit permissions because it's clear and right. back and we didn't implement it yet uh, and back for instance better edition um, but yeah we need to take well a lot of things into account and um, but yeah everything which is managed by the hypervisor can be dealt with dealt by uh, the hypervisor yeah it's and just the I guess I'm I'm making sure I want to understand the, the mechanism because once the permissions are set, then you have to enforce them against potential future calls to unset or change them. Yes. And in that case, you have to have a record of what is, I don't think yeah, right? Yeah. 
Okay. So yeah. So I would. So so it just sounds like it implies the nature of there's a set of shadow page tables somewhere to so enforce it. So wait, one thing to to so we don't have. We didn't have time to explain everything, yeah. Um, but yeah, the simple use case is to make some memory pages permission immutable to not be able to change that, and that also is the main use case for CIP. Um, but in some use cases, and what we took about yesterday, for instance, um, is how to make the guest scan memory protection more dynamic. Because, for instance, when you want to load the kind of module, when you want to use the EBPF JIT or KProbe and stuff like that, well, you need to change the current permissions. And for that, well, you need to kind of uh, move your trust from the guest to something else. And that can be done, for example, with scan modules with scan signatures. You can, uh, well, first sign your kernel, your scan modules, uh, pass these um, public keys to the hypervisor, VTL1, whatever. And then later on, when the guest um, put it and is compromised, then the IPV can still uh, keep the trust from the initial boot kernel and then do this kind of check. But yeah, it's getting um, complex. I have a question. So I have a question for Tara. Uh, so have you, do you already have some idea of uh, parts of Linux that could be moved to VTL1? And uh, and if so, what uh, kind of kernel would you use? And would they be in user space or would they be in kernel space? We haven't really explored it, but one thing I want to say is like Mikhail said, the module authentication is the, probably the, one of the first things we will get to doing because it is needed if we enforce memory permissions in the kernel, right? So in which case the authentication mm -hmm. itself can be moved into VTL1. We can do it in a step-by-step -step manner where we first say that we protect the keys, we make sure that the keys that exist in VTL0 is read-only and things like that, but then eventually it is probably we are looking at the authentication itself to move into whatever <laughs> kernel is sitting in VTL1. So, yeah. And then when you say, I think, I, I think that it is better for development and uh, support if we can have most of the services run in a secure user space than in the kernel because you don't have to go ahead and change the kernel for everything that you need, new services that you want to introduce. <coughs> but again, that is an evolution and probably the first thing we will do is to move it to secure kernel and then we will evaluate if we can move it as a secure user space. So that, that's one of the shortcomings of Coco on that. Coconut doesn't have a user space right now. It'd be nice to have a full I, I, I don't know who space. asked first. So you I can... think this guy. <laughs> yeah. Have you thought about device accessing VTL1? You know, doing interacting with devices somehow? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. No, we don't. No, we're not doing, we have not thought of device access in VTL1. I want to say that there is another project happening in Microsoft where there is a soft piece of software running, Linux kernel running in a more higher privilege level in VTL2, mm -hmm. uh, where there is some kind of device access and emulation and all happening. But that is kind of out of scope of what we are trying to achieve here with respect to security. And how much of the current VTL, TLFS uh, spec, do you do you want to reuse? Or are you thinking of reusing it? Or you want to create something from scratch? For secure kernel? Yeah, for, to introduce all these VTL, to generalize VTLs out. Are you, are you planning on reusing TLFS to some extent? Oh, yeah, we are plan reusing fully. TL fully. Yes, okay. we are not going to change the Hyper-V at all for that matter. Uh, lovely. Yeah. We want to keep changes as minimal as possible. That is the premise in which we started this project. Perfect. So it may be possible for you know, your, <laughs> your work to integrate potentially uh, in some ways. But uh, from our point of view with the Hyper-V side, there's not going to be any change to Hyper-V. So we're, we're out of time. We'll be up here for a while uh, if people want to continue the conversation. Uh, it's during the break. Thanks. Thank you. I see it cut off. I see it cut off. <laughs>